Let's get into the word. Hope you got a study guide. If you didn't, raise your hand. One of our men will be glad to assist, help you, and bring you one. Without God, everything is nothing. Today we're dealing with, and you thought time was on your side? Well, time is not on your side. And when we're in a study, and have been for the last couple of weeks, on the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 today. Every day, God deposits. You know, we take this for granted, and we just think, oh, okay, you know, another day. But do you realize that every day God is depositing 24 hours in the bank called time, and he's doing it just for you. So it is our responsibility to use that time, that investment that God gives us, and to use it wisely. And we know that uh, we'll never get it back. I mean, yesterday, you cannot bring back. You can't make any difference as far as yesterday is concerned. You can't go back and relive that. It's kind of like life is like, like a coin. You can spend it. Uh, any way you want to, but you can't spend it but once. So every day is a gift from God. So, you know, I think, though, if we are probably honest with ourselves, we don't use our time wisely. You know, any of y'all waste time? Come on. I know I'm not the only one. Yeah, I got a few more honest folk in here. Anyway, but here's some stats for you this morning that will be interesting to you about how you spend your time. One-third of your time you spend sleeping. Hmm. You say, I'm tired. Get up and do something. Make you feel better. Ten years of your life, you consume that in working. Wow. Then the, you watch television over nine years of your life. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We, we clean our homes. Horse are like this over a year of our life. He probably does about three or five years. I don't know. Amen. Uh, we cook about 2.5 years of our lives. And then we spend over three years eating what we've prepared. We drive our cars for over four years of our life. Amazing. I was uh, ran into Judy Bowman Friday, and she's with Wheelpower Bicycling, and they are getting ready to leave this week. They've driven up to Maine, and they're going to bike all the way to Florida. And it's all by giving out tracts and witnessing for the Lord. Only God only knows how many souls they've won. And I asked her, I said, Judy, how many miles have you probably traveled in ministry on that bicycle uh, winning souls to Christ? She said over 300,000 miles. That's amazing. And then you spend about 70% of your life on digital media. <laughs> That's where we've come to in our world. I mean, I believe, my Lord, this is enough. I, these stats are almost depressing in one sense of the speaking, but time gets away from us, and we waste a lot of our time also. Now, time may not be on your side, but I've got good news for you this morning. You want some good news? Say amen. amen. Well, the good news is God is on your side. He's on our side today, so we can rejoice in that. As we go through uh, the verses here in chapter uh, 3 of, of Ecclesiastes, these are very familiar verses that we've heard and we have applied through our life. And uh, we're going to glean from these verses today some great information. And, uh, and the key verse, though, is found in, we launch a little bit further into chapter 3 in verse 11. It says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, turn to your neighbor and say, You're beautiful. Don't lie now. I know some of you didn't tell nobody nothing. <laughs> it's okay. He had made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he had set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. So God is not a victim uh, of time to be pitied today, but he is the author of time to be praised. Praise the Lord. He's given you another day. As I awakened early this morning, even before the sun came up, I was laying there praising the Lord for a new day. Thank the Lord he opened my eyes. And then as I was leaving the house and driving out of the driveway and heading down the road, I said, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord for a beautiful day of sunshine, blue skies, and the blessings of the Lord. Amen. So, you know, God should be praised. You ought to thank him. Don't ever take anything for granted that God gives you. Without God, time is just a random chance that basically leaves you in a place of frustration or it can leave you in a place of jubilation. But with God, everything in time has a place and has a purpose. So God has a plan in everything that's happening in your life. You may have thought, well, man, I had a terrible day yesterday. Why did God let me have a bad day? 
so he could give you a good day today and be in church. See, God works everything out, doesn't he? And I'd like to stand up here and tell you this morning, man, life is just wonderful all the time. You can walk around with a smile on your face and just be happy, happy, happy. But it's not always that way, is it? Sometimes life brings us disappointments and trials. But it's our responsibility to take whatever life brings us and gain from it what God's going to bring good out of it through it. So that's important. We can find peace in the, even in the midst of difficult circumstances today knowing that they will fit into the overall plan of the timing of God in our lives. So today we're going to deal with what is probably one of the most popular passages in the book of Ecclesiastes. Listen, in today's passage, we're going to find out the secret to life. So pay attention and listen. We're going to find out the, 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 the secret to life. So you can learn to communicate with God's divine purpose for us during those difficult seasons of life. And you may be right in the midst of a difficult season right now. God's going to bring good out of it. I promise you that because God said so. There is a season for everything, isn't there? So realizing this today, God has a time and a purpose and a plan for everything. So he has a time, a, pl a purpose, and a plan. So you will be frustrated if you don't learn to cooperate. That's why a lot of frustrated people on planet Earth. But you'll, you, will, you will be frustrated if you don't learn to cooperate today with God's intentions during those difficult seasons of life. You know why some of us stay in those difficult places so long? Because we won't trust God and won't praise him through what we're facing. God wants to bring you through those things. Today we're going to look at basically three lessons about time which demonstrate God's involvement in our life. God wants to do good things in your living today. The first thing is God organizes time in a meticulous way. Now, going back to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season, we're all familiar with that verse, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. So realizing this today, in, in the text today, we find the word time, and actually the word time appears about 30 times just in these portions of scripture that we're looking at today. What we see is there is an appointed time for everything that happens in our lives. So Solomon's using the word things uh, or thing, which infers today willful activity during these times of life and the things that we face. Now, Solomon is making a point that no matter what happens in history, God is always in control. Isn't that good to know? Man, he is in control. And you know whatever you're in, facing, going through, and you think, man, where's God? He's in control. And he is going to work a purpose and a plan and do something good in and through what he is accomplishing. So God's always using the season of life for his glory and for our good. God brings good out of everything. So we have to be in a position of trusting him. Remember, God is outside of time. He's not controlled by time. He's outside of time. As a matter of fact, God's always above time, organizing time in a meticulous way for you and I, that we can be blessed through that. So Solomon says in verse 1, there's a time for everything. Then he's going to go through, and we're going to see here in just a moment, in Ecclesiastes 2, uh, verses 2 through 8, we find Solomon gives us 14 reasons to prove the validity of this point pertaining to that there's a time for everything. So verse 2 says, a time to be born. I think we've been there, right? A time to be born and a time to die. Thank God we haven't been there yet. And a time... <laughs> Y'all are alive this morning, aren't you? Say amen. amen. Right, we don't have no corpses sitting here, do we? Okay, good. Hallelujah. So there's a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. Amen. So these are the seasons. Now... The theme of the text is entirely of human existence. So our entire existence, listen to this, our entire existence depends upon God. Now, even those who declare there is no God, one day they're going to find out he is real. Amen. So Solomon gives us the most basic evidence that God organizes time for us. Because you know what? Every time we try to organize time, we mess it up. But I'm glad he's got it all under control. So Solomon starts with the most basic thing. See, God's always a God of chronological order. He always puts things in their right perspective. 
So he starts with the basic thing that there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Now, we know our birth date. We don't know our death date. And I'm not really worried about it. I, I'm interested. I, sometimes I'll see when I'm on Facebook, which is not very often anymore, people with some kind of an app out there that you can do a thing and you can... Um, you know your birth date, and you put something in, I guess, and it tells you when you're going to die. And, now, of course, all these are way out in the future. What would you do if you put your information in there and it said your death date was tomorrow? I tell you what we'd, most of us would do. We'd panic, wouldn't we? Amen. We'd run to our lawyer and make sure our will was okay. We'd make sure our burial plot was all ready to go. I mean, listen, don't put yourself in the grave before you're supposed to be there, praise God. Amen. Concentrate on the living that God's given you. So birth and death are completely in the hands of the Lord. It's God who gives life, and it's God then who calls us home. So God has planned your life when you are born, when you will be born, and also when you will die or pass away. Now concerning that death, I think it's important that we understand the importance of that God gives us a period called time, uh, a life of preparation that we can prepare for that place and time when death shall come. It's really important to be ready. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. You can't go back and change anything after death. I mean, now is our season of preparation. That's why God allows us time. So birth, both uh, birth and death are necessary because this is the way God organizes it. There is a specific time to plant also, and he talks about planting and harvest. There's a time to plant, and there's a, a time to the harvest. You don't plant a garden in January unless you live in a sunny environment, in a warm environment. You, you have to cooperate with the specifics God ordains that you plant successfully. I know some of our folks in here that plant, they go strictly by the farmer's albanac and you do this at this time and you do this at that time. I've never read that thing. Spring is a time you plant and, and fall is a time that you harvest. And through the months that you get blessed with all those luscious tomatoes and corn and beans and amen. Somebody said amen. So you've got to cooperate with the seasons that God gives you. Farmers know nature only works for them when they work, of course, with nature. So you've got to, you can't plant your garden in the middle of January or February or even March. So God has made everything appropriate in a place called time. You can never be successful in what we would call the art of living until you cooperate with God's principles about time. And I want you to get this in your spirit. Time is a gift from God and expects us to use it wisely. Don't get frustrated when God plants you in a time of life that is difficult. Now, I know we all want life on the smooth side, right? We don't want any valleys. We don't want any trials. We don't want any problems. But that's not the way life is. We're living in imperfect bodies. We're living in an imperfect world. It's because of sin. But we can learn from God that we can take and see God work good out of the bad situations that we face. So the key is cooperate wherever God puts you. Cooperate wherever God puts you. Don't get a sour spirit. Well, I don't know why I'm going through this. You know, where's God in the middle of my mess? I mean, you know. We, 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 if, if life is not sunshine and roses all the time, if we're not careful, we Christians can get an attitude, can't we? Hello, y'all. Amen. So it's better to cooperate. You know your quickest way out of your problems? Trust God and praise him. Amen. Just let him do the work that he is going to do. Ecclesiastes 3.3 3 says, there's a time, oh, this one's going to get you, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. <laughs> Wait a minute, preacher. Hate? You know, wait a minute. This is a part of the verse that deals with, I believe, capital punishment. Genesis 9 and 6 says, Whoso, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For, the, for in the image of God made he man. So if someone recklessly takes the life of someone made in the image of God, the punishment is so severe that life can be taken from them as well. That's just a part of it. So this is not an Old Testament principle. 
Because let me tell you what the New Testament says. Romans 13, 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to, to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt uh, have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he that heareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So, see, there's a time to kill, there's a time to heal. And, and God gives grace through whatever season that we're in. So he gives us what is needed. And he provides for us, either in the body or through the marvelous medicine to provide healing. Aren't you glad today with his stripes you're healed? Aren't you glad he is the great physician? Aren't you glad he's still in control? Amen. Randy had some surgery this past Thursday. Here he is in church this morning. The Lord's healing him up. He's a little tender. Don't, don't be too hard on him today. But, uh, but he's doing good. Amen. But the Lord's healing him. And that's awesome. How many of you experienced the healing power of God? Raise your hand and shout amen. Amen. Sure. Amen. Further, Solomon said, there's a time to tear down. There's a time to build up. That doesn't mean you tear down people. Uh, you realize there's a time old things needs to be torn down. And new things need to be built up. You know, sometimes old buildings need to come down to build new buildings. And sometimes God has to get old things out of our life so he can put new things in our life. So what Solomon said in verse 3 continues also in verse 4. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Amen. So weeping and laughing are natural emotions that come from the heart. They're part of you. Every one of us has it. Every person on planet Earth has it. So you, you may try and make people think that you're happy all the time. You ever met somebody? Man, you think, this dude never has a problem. I promise you every dude and every person has problems in their life. So you know sometimes we pull the, the shade of a false facade to let me make people think everything's good on the outside, but inside, buddy, we got 40,000 butterflies flying in 40,000 different directions. We in a mess. So understand this. Honestly, it's not normal. It's not normal. Do you hear that? It's not normal to be happy all the time. But don't walk around with a frown on your face all the time either. Amen. There's, there's a season when weeping is more appropriate. So therefore, there are seasons of weeping and there are seasons of laughter. So the season you cooperate with. Hallelujah. Solomon's saying that tears are appropriate in certain circumstances. I mean, how inappropriate you go to someone's funeral and you sit there and you laugh. <laughs> I hope you don't do that. Amen. Even Jesus in John eleven thirty five, 35, the Bible speaks of Jesus and talking about the weeping over Lazarus. And um, he simply said that Jesus wept. See, there was the humanity. You are human. You've got emotions. You've got feelings. There's times you're going to weep. There's times you're going to laugh. But don't go around weeping all the time. Thank God for Psalm 30 and 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. So it, it's okay to be brokenhearted at times. But listen, not all the time. Don't walk around carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. What you can change, change. What you can't change, trust God, he will. So learn to trust him. Solomon said there's an appropriate time to weep. There's an appropriate time to laugh. Proverbs 17, 22. This is really a good scripture. We need to learn this one. A merry heart is like a good medicine. Amen. You know what? Some of us are sick because we're sick and tired of living. We get all bent out of shape with all the problems of life and everything else. You're cutting years off of your life. Did you know that? God wants you to live. He gives you every day to what? Not walk around and mope and be down in the dumps. He gives you every day to live. Hallelujah. So a good heart, it even affects your mind. It will even affect the chemistry of your body. Amen. So listen, it's okay to have a good time when God is glorified. Christians don't have to walk around hump-shouldered and pious with the corners of their mouth hung down to their kneecaps. <laughs> it's all right to be happy. It's all right to have a good time. Amen. So praise God. You don't have to look like the picture that is on your driver's license. Amen. <laughs> it's good to see you smiling. The key is the appropriate ex expression 
of these emotions must correspond to the season that we find ourselves in. Ecclesiastes 3 and 5. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to restrain from embracing. So in the Old Testament, uh, one of the methods of warfare, of course, was casting stones. <laughs> uh, these, these, they'd use these big stones on a catapult, and boom. And I mean, they would wipe out people and wipe out different things with it. Stones were gathered to prepare for war. They were also, stones were also gathered to build roads, houses, and different things of that nature and quality. So Solomon said there's a time to embrace others and there's a time to shun others too. Wait a minute. Not only is Solomon talking about warfare, but he also talks about our relationship. Now he's not talking about, let's go back to the A part of that verse. It's not a, he's not giving you permission to cast stones at people. Okay? And by casting stones, I don't mean literally casting stones. I'm talking about we get in the position of our life that we slander people. And that's not what God wants you to do. Amen? Hello? Y'all there? All right. So we, we should embrace sound doctrine. We should shun poor doctrine. We should embrace those who promote harmony. We should today reject those who foster division. So that being the case today, also there's a time that you need a reassuring hug. Anybody need a hug right now? Christian needs a hug. Somebody run back and give him one. He needs it. Poor thing. Look at him. Lord have mercy. Little Kramer Jr. back there. Amen. Amen. Oh, I don't think he wants a hug from a guy. I want him to hug from a Amen. Sorry about that, buddy. Amen. Sometimes it's good to hug a friend. Sometimes it's just nice. It brings some, brings some reassurance in your life. And there's a time that we need to be confronted with the wrong in our life. But also do it in a spiritual, biblical application. Then we go to Ecclesiastes 3, 6, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. So, sure, there's a time to accumulate, but there's also a time to get rid of some things in our life too. You got anything you need to get rid of? I'm talking about in your life, you know? In your character, in your walk. I'm not talking about your closets being too full. You're moving, I know. Clean your closets out, bless God. Set it out the curb there. Come pick it up. Ecclesiastes 3 and 7 says, A time to rend and a time to uh, sow and a time to keep silent and a time to speak. Amen. Sometimes we engage our mouth before we engage our brain, don't we? Mm-hmm. In Bible times, the tearing of a garment was an expression of grief. Now, when the garment was sewn together again, it meant the time of mourning was over. Did you hear that? You can't mourn the rest of your life. I mean, we all have hurts in our life, don't we? Losses in our life. But you can't mourn all your life. Solomon's saying it's appropriate to grieve, but it's equally important to move on in the seasons of life. You can't live in the past. It doesn't do anything for you. Don't feel guilty about moving on. So you, you can't remember the past, but you know what? Listen, you can remember the past, actually, but don't let it control you. Don't let it manipulate you. Don't let it rob you of what God wants to do for you today, and you still got your heart and your mind fixed somewhere back in the past. So also there's a time to open our mouths. <laughs> Listen to this one. And also there's a time to shut your mouth. And the church said. Have you opened your mouth and inserted your foot any time in your life? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes, listen, folks, being honest with you today, sometimes your opinion doesn't matter. It's not going to make a difference. Sometimes having the last word is not necessary. Any of you guys or gals have experienced that in your relationship at home? Okay. <laughs> well, I heard a few amens out there. The rest of us are lying, I guess. But anyway, Proverbs 25 and 11 says, A word fitly spoken in, is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. So Ecclesiastes 3, 8, and I've got to roll along here quickly. A time to love. Y'all like that one, don't you? All right, come on. A time to love. Come on. A time to love. Amen. Man. And a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So of all the verses of Solomon's uh, litany of evidence, uh, this verse is one that's not received real well. 
This may seem confusing, but love is the ultimate expression of Christianity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Bible teaches we should love Christ. The Bible teaches that we should love one another. Amen. People may wear different clothes, have different styles and, and of life, and, and live in different places. But we still ought to love people. People not all like us. And sometimes that's good. Amen. But realizing this today, we should love Christ. We should love one another. We should even, here you go. Now I'm going to here take the shout of the meeting. We should even love our enemies because the word declares that. The Bible says it itself. God is love. And you know what? We have not always been the picture of perfection, have we? But God loved us in spite of who we were and what we were. And his love extended towards us and redeemed us. Aren't you glad you're redeemed this morning? Amen. Are y'all glad you're saved? Come on now. All right. To, amen. To love, lovely correct someone, there's something, you know, there's some things in life that we have to hate too. To be, to be, uh, to be people of love, friends, listen, we do not have approval, uh, have to approve everything that somebody does. So that, that, that gives us no grounds to hate a person. We ought to hate sin. We ought to hate Satan. We ought to hate pride. And if you'll go to the book of Proverbs, Solomon tells you the things that you should hate in life, the things that God hates. And if you'll incorporate those in your life, it'll make you a stronger Christian of love. Amen. Psalm 97.10 says, Ye that love the Lord, you hate evil. Now, if you want to know what God hates, as I said, it's in uh, Proverbs 5. Actually, and it's in verses 16 through 19. Further, Solomon said there's a time for war, there's a time for peace. We should pray and we should work for peace. But there's a time when that we need to preserve peace, and in order to preserve peace, you have to fight to preserve it. How many former military people got in the room right now? Raise your hand. There maybe was a time in your life that you had to fight to preserve the peace of our nation. And friend, listen, that's a part of the plan of God. The key to all these 14 evidences that we've covered in this little short span of time, God has an appropriate time for everything. Therefore, we can do the right thing at the right time. You have no excuse for doing wrong. I don't care what somebody said to you. I don't care what somebody did to you. I don't care how, how you got up on the wrong side of the bed. If you got up on the wrong side of the bed, well, bless God, get back in the bed and get out on the right side. Or do something. Don't get up and don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder. Because you know what? You're not doing a thing to help yourself. All you're doing is defeating yourself. All you're doing is repelling people away from you. I mean, if you want to be that type of person, uh, move someplace and get into the depths of the woods and where the sun doesn't even shine and become a hermit. Amen. But you're going to be in a world where there's people and you've got to learn to, to care for people and to exhibit the love of God. Second thing today, God orchestrates time in a masterful way. So Ecclesiastes 3 and 9 says, What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? Without God, time is not on our side. And life is a cycle of meaningless events if you don't have the Lord in your life. Going on to verse 10 and 11. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Oh, man, that's great, isn't it? He even makes beautiful people. Mm-hmm. He really does. Amen. Maybe your exterior is not the prettiest thing in the world. But if you've got Jesus living within you, you're the prettiest thing in the world. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're pretty. Amen. Now, some of you guys may be offended by that, but you're still pretty anyway. Amen. Randy, you're pretty. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He had made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he had, met, he had set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, let me wrap this up real quick. With God, everything is appropriate in its time. So certain pieces in the puzzle of life can sometimes be burdensome and painful, yet God makes everything beautiful in its time. So time may not be on your side, but hallelujah, God is. Praise the Lord. God orchestrates a 
masterful way to produce a beautiful product. Think what God has done in your life since you've gotten saved. Think of the, the way that he has transformed you and how he has conformed you and how he has taken your life and how he has changed your living, has changed your attitude, has changed everything about you. And you're still a work in progress. You have not reached the pinnacle of all that you can be. So you are a work in motion. Let God work in your life to do what God's doing. To make you who he wants you to be. Don't be satisfied with where you are. God's got something bigger and greater for you. Amen. Therefore, here's what the, the counterpart of Ecclesiastes 3 is Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that, who, are the called, who are the called according to his purpose. So hear this. God's fingerprints cover everything. Amen. God has a purpose in your life. So you won't, be, you won't find satisfaction in anything until you find out what God has in store for you in your life. Third thing, and I'm through. God operates time in a mysterious way. Solomon's conclusion in verse 11 is there are some things even when great faith can't figure things out. Because you can't figure everything in the, Bible, in the Bible, don't worry about that. We can't always answer the question, why? And there may be questions that still loom in your life of why that maybe you will not know until you stand before the righteous judge. Amen. We don't know what God is doing all the time. And it's not necessary that we do know. But we can live with the assurance that God knows the why of life. And whether he reveals it or not, you just got to live for him and trust him by faith. Time is not on your side, but again, I tell you, God is. Even when you can't understand what's happening in life, know that he understands you. And that God will orchestrate time with the dark clouds of difficulty and mingled with the sunny days that he provides in our living of joy for God's God then can make real music. You know, he talked about dancing. He can, you can't dance without music, really. I mean, you can try, but you just look like a fool. But, you, you know, you got some good music going. Oh, Lord. Anyway, God will make real music in your life that you can, your life can be a living testimony for him. Man measures time by minutes. God sees time from the beginning to the end. So be assured, God knows what he's doing. And as I close this morning for the 15th time, if, if you're going to beat the clock, you have to give your life to God. If you're going to beat the clock, you've got to give your life to God. God can make all things beautiful in his time. You just need to believe on him and in him so that you can be a work produced through him in your life. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning for the precious word of God that is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you for the cooperation of this waiting congregation today that they listened attentively and participated, and I pray they have received inspiration and information today that will change their life. Thank you today for your mighty presence. We pray now, Lord, as we move from this season of teaching into a season of worship. I pray today that, Lord, you will just be uh, so mightily praised and worshiped in the house of the living God. May we today focus our attention upon you and realize today, even when we're in the mess of life, Lord, you can work a miracle. Have your will in your way. Bless your people and be honored and glorified in this house. And we say to God, be honored, praise, and glory, both now and forevermore. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children put their hands together. And praise the Lord and said, Amen.